In this episode of Restore It, it's time to get the E30 back onto the rotisserie and coated in the correct paint so it won't rust whilst I get the welding done. The main reason I want it back on the rotisserie is so that I can flip it on its side and shot blast the areas which are hard to reach whilst the car is right side up, and it'll of course make the welding much easier. Another reason is that it became almost impossible to move around on the dollies that I made. I had no idea why it was getting harder and harder to push around until I looked at the wheels and discovered how and why I'd pulled every muscle in my body recently. I knew I was pushing my luck with these casters but I didn't think this would happen to them. Lesson learnt, definitely don't cheap out on casters. For the time being I swapped out the worst one for these two co-op chassis movers. Very handy indeed. They're usually for moving bread about but they work just as well for cars. Only some of the undercoating has been removed and in those spots surface rust has started to appear so those areas will need blasting and protecting like the rest of the car. In a future episode I'm going to remove all of the old undercoating, blast the bottom and prime it. The plan has slightly changed since last episode. Once all of the welding is done I'm going to have the car dipped and e-coated so all of the rust will be gone and every inch of the car will be electroplated like it was from the factory. So before we can get her on the rotisserie there's a small issue that needs dealing with. On E30s the way the rotisserie attaches to the front is via these two square captive nuts. As you can see, the driver's side has taken quite the beating, either from the rotisserie itself, or it was already in a bad way before it went on for the first time. Either way, I'm going to have to repair this properly before I can trust it as a mounting point. It looks like someone's tried to fix this at some point, but a nut that's been tacked in doesn't really fill me with a lot of confidence. After much thinking, I decided not to repair this one. If something was to go wrong whilst it was on the rotisserie, it could cause a lot more work, and it could genuinely squash me if the car fell off. Instead, I'm going to use the now donor car to get the piece I need. And I just want to say thanks to everyone in the comments who made me feel a lot better about giving this one the chop. I still have the rear quarters to remove, and once it's done I'm going to start chopping the whole chassis into smaller bits and keep them for the future. For now though, the bit I need is right at the front, and so I'm going to strip everything off, saving what I can along the way. But before I do that, I want to quickly thank Noom for sponsoring this episode. Noom is a new way to achieve your fitness goals and stay healthy using psychological tools based in cognitive behavioural therapy. That sounds clever, but Noom is actually quite simple. I've been using it for months now and it's become a part of my everyday routine. Even before I knew about Noom, I knew my eating habits weren't great. The food itself, the times at which I was eating, the amount of water I drank, the list goes on. I would often feel tired in the mornings, fatigued during the day and all round not as good as I knew I could feel. But I didn't need a diet or a strict regime that I wasn't going to stick to, I needed to think about it differently. Although Noom is about weight loss, it's also about creating lasting change on a psychological level, the type of change I needed to cut those bad habits. Getting started on your personalised Noom programme is easy, just click the link in the description below to take your free 30 second quiz. The reason I started using Noom is because like you, I found out about it whilst watching a YouTube video, only in my case it was at 1am after finishing work late whilst I ate my dinner of unknown calorific value. This probably isn't the best decision, but that's what Noom's all about, decision making. It's all about helping you learn why you make the decisions you make and how your mind works so you can make small daily tweaks that lead to long lasting change. What I like about Noom is that it's a behaviour change programme. It offers daily lessons and food tracking functionality, it leverages psychology, personal coaches and mobile technology to help you live a smarter and healthier life. For myself, I've found Noom's food and water trackers to be the most helpful. So let's say I wake up and have some cereal, and then at lunch a Subway, and for dinner a whole Domino's pizza. I just search for the foods, enter the amounts, and it's there, all easily stored in the log, and I'd know for sure that I'd had way too many calories on that day, and the same goes if I haven't eaten or drank enough. So if you have fitness and health goals that you are trying to achieve, then click the link in the description below and take their free 30 second quiz to get started. Big thanks to Noom for the support, let's get back to the BMW. Sadly, most of the parts left on this chassis are ruined in some way or another. Bits like these bumper brackets are fine, it's just all of the stuff that you really want like the front balance, the bottom lip piece, the lights, that are all absolutely past repair. So if you see me ripping something off violently, it's definitely already dead.
With all of that out of the way, that's enough for me to get the bit I need. I can now start work on cutting the mounting plate out without damaging it. I'm punching the centre of the spot weld so I can drill pilot holes and then use a spot weld drill bit to weaken the connection between the two bits of metal. My main concern here is to not touch the mounting plate. I want it to keep its shape so it's an easy swap onto the main chassis. I've really sped through this, but it actually took me a very long time to carefully extract this piece. It's so much work for such a small piece in the puzzle that is this restoration, and yes I could have just gone to somewhere like E30 Garage Norway for one, but I just prefer the idea of recycling this genuine one from a car that has no other use. But that does lead me onto this. The Mercedes is almost back together, but it's taking half of my time up, the time that would be spent on the E30. So bear with me for a little bit longer and soon I'll be able to squeeze a lot more into these main project episodes. So as you can see, this bad boy is almost out. It's just the three bottom spots that are holding it in place. As I had ground down most of the welds by this point, it was just a case of cutting the excess and freeing it. And there it is, a little bit rusty and rough around the edges, but nothing a quick cleanup and blast can't fix. I'm using medium crushed glass for those of you who are wondering. I find it works great for most things. I can now flap disc away all of the leftover bits of spot weld. I've got to be quite careful not to go too far with the flap disc and weaken it, which would make all of this pointless. Before I can protect it with paint, I need to remove some old seal and overspray, possibly from the factory. I can now protect it for the time being with some World 3 Primer. And there we go, it almost looks brand new. Now just to install it. Nope, that's not right, we need to first remove the damaged one from the chassis. So this time round, I need to only damage the mountain plate and leave the rest of the car untouched. Because these plates are made from quite thick metal and it's a bit awkward to get at, I'm going to drill all the way around the edge of the face and then cut that out first.
With that gone, I can now more easily get to the spot welds holding it in place. The finger sander really came in handy here. With some 36 grit sanding belts, it made light work of the rest of the plate face, as well as grinding down the spot welds so they can be split off. I decided the best way to do this is to cut it into small sections and focus on one at a time. I started at the bottom, which is the side I struggled with the most on the removal, and once that was sorted, I moved up the sides towards the top. With it now completely gone, I can punch the old spot welds so I can drill them out and then make way for my new plug welds. And there it is, not too much damage to think about, and it looks like a new one should just slot right in. Before it goes in, I'm going to give it a few coats of weld through primer and then drill the holes for the welds. For the bottom lip, I'm going to drill the plate instead just to make it easier to weld in. So now, this should fit like a glove. A tiny bit of hammering needed, but it's in. I'm using the other side that's untouched as a guide to get it in exactly the same position. Once it was there, I locked it in place with a couple of vice grips and made a few final adjustments. I can now plug weld all of the holes to really lock it in place. And the first one was terrible. It's been a few months since I last welded and I'm a bit rusty. I think by the time I finish this chassis I'll be a much better welder, but it's going to take 50 years so I best get going. The finger sander really is my best friend with these types of jobs, I just don't know what I would do without it. With the top edge in, you can see the work that's needed to bring everything together like the original. Thankfully the vice grips will do most of that work. I went over my first few welds again after getting back into the swing of things, but there it is, completely welded in. Now I just need to sand them down, make a few final adjustments, and it should all be good to go. I managed to get the gap around the outside to mostly disappear and I think once it's painted it will look completely factory and you won't even be able to tell it's been changed. A quick coat of weld through just to stop it flash rusting and that'll be it. For the first repair back after the break, 
I'm very happy with it and intend to carry on in this fashion. And the more the donor car does for the main project, the better I'm feeling about it. Before we get to test out my welding, I thought I'd give the rotisserie a very quick tidy up as it's become quite rusty over the four years it's been in use. I'm going to first brush the excess rust off, treat it with Genolite Rust Converter and then paint it. Genolite Rust Converter is great for this sort of thing when you don't want to blast it back to bare metal and go through all that sort of hassle. Just wipe it down, give it a good coating and then wait three hours. With that done, I now won't get rust on my hands every time I move the car around. Now just to get it built up and get the car mounted. It's been so long I forgot how to use it, but these T-pieces are adjustable and need to be high enough so that when the car turns on its side, it doesn't hit the bottom bar. I won't lie, this is a bit daunting. Putting the car on a rotisserie is bad enough, let alone bolting it onto a fresh repair of mine, really putting it to the test straight away here. Thankfully, everything did line up and it all went relatively well. I made it look like I did everything, but I did actually have some help from Scott, Tony and Isla, so thanks to those guys for that. With the car mounted and movement a breeze once again, I can get started on the final bit of blasting. The only bits left are the inside of the roof, the inside of the boot, and the underside. Because the car is now getting dipped, whenever I come across something like this, I'm removing it so it doesn't disappear during the process. There really isn't that much blasting to do, and the rotisserie makes everything so much easier. I highly recommend one to anyone who's doing this kind of work to their car. They're not too expensive and the amount of time saved will have it paid off in no time. Quite a while ago now, a friend of mine spent some time removing some undersill from the bottom of the car, which has led to some surface rust, so I'm blasting that off, as well as all of the smaller bits of underseal, just because the blaster makes light work of it. With most of the underside done and only little bits to focus on, I sprayed them with yellow paint as a reminder of where to aim. And thankfully, that's it for the blasting. You can see glass just falling out of it, so I need to give it one final clean as best as I can, and then it's ready for proper protection. Speaking of which, this is the paint I should have used last episode. I found out about this paint and the whole coating system from Novol after I'd finished the engine bay, but thankfully, the engine bay is where I stopped. This is an anti-corrosion, temporary, weld through, bodywork primer from Novo. Quite the mouthful, but quite the coating as well. It has up to six months of anti-corrosion protection, it's weldable and tackable without removal, and it's specifically designed for full vehicle bodies after power cleaning. Now that part about power cleaning is important. According to the datasheet, 
For perfect adhesion, it wants the metal to be cleaned to SA2.5, which is wet blasting, or ST3, which is manual cleaning with a power tool. It says the surface should show the gloss of the metal substrate. So I think that means I need to wire wheel the entire car before I can paint it. Blasting has left it matte, which is the opposite of what it describes there. But there we go, it's a perfect chance for me to remove any signs of leftover rust. I'm going to do this in stages, as holding a grinder for minutes on end can get quite painful after a while. Before painting each section, I rubbed them down with silicone remover and then a tack cloth to ensure the surface was contamination free. I swapped between the grinder, the palm sander and the drill to polish as much of the metal as I possibly could. This is only a temporary protective layer, so it doesn't really matter if I don't get every millimetre. I just want to do as much as I can to stop it from rusting before the acid dip. It certainly took some time and elbow grease, but with a funny podcast on, you barely know you're doing it, and before you know it, it's done. With all of the floor and the sides done, I wiped them down and sprayed some more primer. About halfway through, I realised that the cap was closed on the top of my spray gun, so it wasn't letting as much fluid through as it should have. With it open, the primer absolutely flies out. Much quicker, and a lot less overspray than the first half. Up next was the boot, or at least what's left of it. After removing some more rubber plugs, I got to shining. With this surface now clean and the spray gun working properly, I added its first coat. Now I know it's already been protected, but I cannot sleep at night knowing the engine bay is a different colour, so I'm just going to paint it. With that done, it's onto the dash area and the roof. Two quite awkward spots to do, so I'll save you the paint.
Although this top section hasn't been blasted and is actually one of the most protected parts of the car right now, still my made up OCD will not allow me to leave it. And finally, where the underseal has been removed needs protecting. Finally, I feel like the car is in a good spot, given the situation, and is now ready for some serious welding which will bring it back to life. Putting the chassis aside for a second, if you remember back to last episode, we took the first of the quarter panels from the donor, but we took a bit more than we needed just to play it safe, and having it away from the chassis makes it a lot easier to remove certain sections. These panels will need welding work before they go back onto the car. But before we can get to that, we need to remove all of the old unwanted bits, starting with the inner B and C pillars, and all of the leftover spot welds from the removal. It was just a case of carefully grinding down the unwanted side without going through to the quarter panel itself. Even though my workshop's on an industrial estate, I felt like I was annoying everyone, so I moved into the spray booth and closed all of the doors. Well, it was definitely taking forever, but it's definitely going to be worth it. The most time consuming part of this is removing the spot welds and the lips that attach to them. I had to be so careful not to touch the precious quarter panel beneath. At the end of the first few hours, this is how far I'd got. Before I left it for the day, I thought I might as well remove the old vibration dampening with a heat gun. A bit of sticker remover and it was like it was never there. The next day, I set about removing the bigger bits. This inner arch obviously needs to go, but I don't think I'm going to waste my time splitting the very bottom bit of it, as that's all going to be cut out when the lip repair panel gets butt welded in.
With most of the inner arch out of the way, I had a bit of a clean up as this is quite a messy job. It was then straight back to making more mess. With the boot section and most of the inner arch gone, there wasn't much left to do, just a small section of the tail panel and a section of the bottom, which I have replacements for from E30 Garage Norway. These bottom pieces attach to the battery piece that's already been installed. I couldn't help myself but to remove the final little bit from the inner arch just to make it that a little bit neater. So now 99% of the cutting is done, I can flip it over and remove the paint with some paint stripper. As a few of you have pointed out in the comments, shot blasting would probably warp it. And that's literally all I had time to get done in this episode. I make it look easy with this editing, but these jobs are so time consuming, this is about as much as I can squeeze in an episode whilst I'm also working on the Mercedes. But there we go. The chassis is in a much better state than it was, it's on the rotisserie and I'm ready to get some real panels from BMW and weld them on. Thanks ever so much for watching, especially if you made it this far, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers.